Welcome to our debate on immigration sponsored by the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech and also sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Uh, immigration, as all of you know, is a very contentious issue in the United States today, and we thought one that uh, lends itself very well uh, to a debate back and forth on the topic, especially because tomorrow the Free Market Institute is sponsoring a, a day-long research conference, and we have, I believe, seven guests from around the country who are joining us to present papers to the faculty and graduate students for a book that we'll ultimately be publishing, uh, exploring many aspects of this issue, and some of them are here in the audience tonight because they, they got in in time to grab, grab dinner with us tonight as well. Um, so we said, when I was talking with Steve, what better thing to do than use the situation to, to have a debate? Unfortunately, one of the people who was supposed to debate um, from the position of we shouldn't significantly liberalize immigration had a health issue and is having a surgery today actually so he couldn't be with us and Steve very generously uh, offered to fill in for him so in that portion of the debate he's going to make some remarks based off a written statement that um, the person had sent in actually for the research conference tomorrow uh, and then Steve's been kind enough to agree to go off the cuff and respond as, as we're going back and forth and on, on my, this issue. My health issue will follow upon that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Presumably the, the health issue had nothing to do with anxiety about the debate here with, with Brian. Um, so we can think of this as exploring a conversation then and hearing both sides of an issue and maybe a little less debatey than what we had intended in the first place. But uh, we'll follow a format where one person has the first 15 minutes to, to give their opening statement. The other person gives a 15 minute opening statement. Each one will have a seven minute response time to the other. Uh, then we'll open it up for questions from all of you in the audience to either or both of them or them to each other a little bit during that as well, uh, depending how they like to dance around on this. And then we'll close the event with each of them having a brief three minute closing statement on this. So without further ado, let me introduce them. Uh, so Dr. Brian Kaplan is a professor of economics at George Mason University. He earned his PhD from Princeton University. He's the author of The Myth of the Rational Voter, which was named the best political book of the year by New York Times. His newer book, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids, is considerably different, uh, although one that he presumably knows something about as a father of four of them. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, he's published in top scholarly economics journals as well as popular outlets including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. I suppose, given that you're going to be presenting remarks in the first section from Dr. London, that I should introduce him too, even though he's not here. It's a little bit odd. I was at a place one time and there was like this, you know, like a rotary where people stand up and say, I'm gonna introduce so-and-so who's with me. And this person gets up and he gives this long, like literally 10 minute introduction to their friend. And then they pull out a picture of their friend and say, this is what they look like. And I'm going to stab them. But in, in this case, his ideas are going to be presented, so we'll tell you where they're coming from. Uh, Dr. Herb London is president emeritus of the Hudson Institute and also emeritus professor of humanities at New York University, where he also earned his PhD. He's author and editor of over 22 books, and he too has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and many other media outlets. Dr. Steve Balch. Uh, my friend and colleague here at the university is the director of the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. He earned his PhD in political science from UC Berkeley. Prior to joining Tech, he served for 25 years, yeah, 25 years as the founding president and chairman of the National Association of Scholars. He has written on higher education issues for a variety of publications and recently co-authored The Vanishing West, 1964-2010. So please join me in welcoming both of our, yeah, well, our guest and someone who works here. Here. <laughs> So the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization has a very powerful statement right on their webpage, which I discovered a few days ago, actually discovered yesterday. Uh, here's the statement. Uh, Western civilization has remade the world. Most of the West inhabitants live lives of which their ancestors could only dream. Doubly long, rich in diet, teeming with comforts and diversions, and most of all, endowed with the gift of liberty. Not just for a privileged few, but for the many. Uh, reading this passage, I was... Uh, I, I would read this for this passage. I found myself as Keynes once told Hayek, not only in agreement, but in deeply moved agreement. Uh, unfortunately, the Institute's fine words embody a major oversight. Uh, in the current world, Western civilization still only belongs to a privileged few. Most of the world's inhabitants are not born in Western nations, and Western nations' laws make it almost impossible for more than a small minority of the world's people to ever come here. Uh, now, my position, uh, is that the world's nations, and this includes, of course, the United States, should abolish their immigration laws, get rid of them entirely. 
Uh, so in my ideal world, anyone who's willing to pay for transportation should be able to legally, should, should be able to travel here legally. Anyone who is willing to pay for housing should be able to live here legally. And anyone who finds a willing employer should be able to work here legally. So it is a stark position, and I freely admit that. Uh, now, if I can't sell you on this radical open borders position, though, I am not going to get mad at all. Instead, I'm going to be like an economist, and I'm going to try to bargain you into as much deregulation as you can possibly stomach. So that's what my, that is my fallback, pro, uh, my fallback plan if I don't sell you on changing your entire worldview in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, why on earth should we grant foreigners the right to travel, live, and work wherever they please? Uh, it's the same reason that we should give these rights to women, to blacks, and to Jews. Uh, they are human beings and they count. They're human beings and they count. Now, is this asking too much? Is this an extremely harsh burden to impose upon people? I say it's not, because I'm not proposing that we give foreigners anything. I'm not proposing that we give foreigners homes or jobs. All I'm proposing is that we allow foreigners to earn these things, uh, to earn these worldly goods from willing native landlords and employers. Now, under current law, uh, housing, housing and employment discrimination against foreigners isn't just legal, it's actually mandatory. It is illegal not to discriminate. You must discriminate. Uh, so, and you know, and why, why? Right, so, so why is this? I mean, ultimately it's because foreigners committed that most terrible crime of choosing the wrong parents. So they, they, were, they chose to be born to people in another country, wickedly, foolishly, rejecting Western civilization from the womb, and as a result, they are not here. Uh, that is their crime. Right now, how horrible is it to do that to someone? Uh, to, blame, to punish them for their entire lives for something that happened before they were even born? And yet that is what the laws of, of course, not just the United States, but every country on Earth actually do. Uh, now, I am very willing to admit there are plenty of things that sound horrible that are actually good. A lot of economics is about teaching people these things. And I say, the minimum wage is actually good? Well, it sounds horrible to say get rid of it, but maybe we should get rid of it. Or to take a more normal example, how about amputating a leg with gangrene? That sounds terrible, but sometimes it's a really good idea. In fact, you know, I think there is gangrene that is generally a very good idea, as far as I know. I know there's, there's medical school here, you can <laughs> tell me. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing the invitations myself, so don't worry. Right now, are immigration restrictions like that? Are they something that sound terrible, but actually, when you really calm down and think about, uh, think about it, actually are a good idea? Uh, well, maybe. Maybe. Uh, so let's consider the leading complaints about immigration. Uh, now, for each complaint, I am going to try to answer two questions. Uh, first of all, how real is the problem? So how real is the problem? And not just, you know, is, the, is it a problem at all, but what is the actual size of the problem? Right, and then secondly, just assuming for the sake of argument the problem is real and very serious, are there any cheaper and more humane remedies than lifelong, lifelong exile from Western civilization? Is there any other way that you could achieve the same ends? Any other way that you could deal with the concerns that don't involve saying that you can't ever come here for as long as you live? Uh, now, the leading complaint about uh, leading complaint, uh, complaint is probably that mass immigration leads to poverty. And so you might think it's you know just you know this is just because you're economists you think this, but it does seem to be the main one that I hear <laughs> when I leave economics and just listen to what people are saying. So it's that econ is that mass immigration causes poverty. Uh, now, virtually every economist who's ever studied this question reaches a very different conclusion, namely that open borders would drastically enrich the world. So it is a, it is a consensus that out of all the policy changes that could possibly <laughs> happen, open borders is the one that would enrich the world the most. Right? In fact, a typical estimate is that free migration would roughly double global GDP, so increase the wealth of the world by about a factor of two. Right, so you know, you know, why? Why would just allowing people to move wherever they want have this massive effect on the wealth of the world? Uh, well, because the world, because the status quo traps most of the world's labor in dysfunctional economies, where people can only produce at a small fraction of their full potential. So, when you move a Haitian from Haiti to the United States, it is totally standard to see that his productivity rises by about a factor of twenty. Right, and if this is hard to believe. Picture how little you could accomplish in Haiti. <laughs> we just dropped you off there. What could you really do? What would you achieve? Uh, probably very little. It's just that it is a dysfunctional economy where whatever talents you have largely go to waste. Right now, the next point, the next point people raise, well, would, this, would a massive influx of foreign labor drive down native living standards? And in a way, when people complain about immigration, they are say it's going to lead to poverty. 
they may not actually even mean it's going to lead to poverty in the world. They often mean it's going to lead to poverty for the people who are already here. Uh, well, the answer here is it depends on what the native actually does. It depends on what the native does. So immigration of workers who produce what you produce makes you worse off. So when there are more economics PhDs led into this country, that makes me worse off. Uh, I'd like to say that right now there's probably an immigrant sitting in the office at Harvard that, that rightfully belongs to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and, you know, so something like 50% of all research, research professors are foreign born. So is this bad for me, at least in terms of, uh, of my labor market options? Uh, of course it's bad for me. Right? However, this is only one side of the story. There's also the other side. Uh, immigration of workers who produce what you produce hurts you. Immigration of workers who produce what you consume helps you. Immigration of workers who produce what you consume helps you. Helps you. So you think about new, new immigration as being a lot like new technology. So driverless cars, are they going to be bad for anyone? Of course, they're going to be terrible for taxi drivers. Driverless cars will be terrible for taxi drivers. However, they enrich everybody else. Everyone who would be consuming these services of taxi drivers is going to be better off as a result of driverless cars being available. Now, what is the net effect when you consider both the people who are helped and the people who are hurt? Uh, here, we can turn to the glorious history of Western civilization for the answer. Right? And the answer is clear cut. Mass production is the mother of, of general prosperity. Mass production is the mother of general prosperity. So when there is an increase in overall production, it does, in fact, wind, wind up leading to higher standards of living for most people. And while there are losers for any individual, for any individual uh, piece of progress, the entire package of progress is way better than the entire package of not having progress. Now finally, so if you're still worried, and I can understand you're still worried because this is a radical proposal and we only have 15 minutes, I'll still say there is a cheaper and more humane remedy than keeping foreigners out. And this is to charge them either an admission fee or a surtax, and then use the proceeds to compensate whatever native workers you think are being hurt as a result. Uh, so the idea here is rather than saying you can't come at all, say you can come here for a, re for a reasonable price. So this could either be an admission fee, where when you cross the border you have to pay one upfront fee, or it could be a surtax, where if you are foreign born you have to pay 10 percentage points of higher taxation. Um, no. Is this fair? I don't think it's fair, but is it better than what we do now? Yeah, it's way better than what we do now. Right? If you are right now stuck in Haiti literally eating dirt, as they were a couple of years ago, and someone says, well, you come to the U.S., but you have to pay 10 percentage points of extra taxation. Are they going to say, oh, no, I don't want that now? They're going to be delighted. It is a huge improvement over what they have right now. And in this way that, what, that whatever concerns you have about the effects of their immigration on native workers, it is not actually that hard to deal with in a way that does not, does not ruin the Haitian's life. Uh, now, the second most popular complaint about immigration is that mass immigration is a massive burden on taxpayers. Um, Milton Friedman himself, one of my very favorite economists in the world, said, quote, you cannot simultaneously have free immigration in a welfare state. And we've got a welfare state, so therefore we cannot have free immigration. Uh, but uh, this was a case where Milton Friedman was not being nearly empirical enough. Uh, the social science tells a very different story, namely that the average immigrant pays about as much in taxes as he uses in, benef use in benefits. There is a range of the estimates in the research from moderately positive fiscal effects to moderately negative fiscal effects, but still, they do tend to concentrate around roughly no difference. Um, now, if this seems hard to believe, and I'll admit that at first pass it is hard to believe, uh, consider this. So first of all, other countries have already paid for most of the education that immigrants are going to have. And as you may know, the cost of, educa of educating kids is enormously high. And furthermore, in fiscal terms, it happens at the beginning, before they paid any taxes. Uh, that, me uh, that means that it is actually a very heavy burden on taxpayers. When an immigrant comes here, his education is generally paid for by his home country, which means that it's not going to be paid for by us. And even if he brings his kids with him, uh, this is it is still better than the deal we get for natives, because for natives, you have to pay for the parents' education and the kids. For immigrants, worst case scenario, you're paying only for the kids, whereas the parents are immediately working and paying taxes as a result. All right, so other countries have already paid for adult immigrants' education, and we don't have to. Uh, secondly, there are a lot of government services, most obviously defense and debt service, that can be consumed for by a larger population at no extra cost. Right, so if you're still, so now if you're still worried, again there is a cheaper and more humane remedy than keeping foreigners out, which is to make them eligible to work but not to collect benefits. And again, there are many variations on this. You would say they're not eligible to collect benefits for a certain number of years until they've been until they've paid 100,000 in taxes. Many different variations can be used in order to handle the concern. 
you know, the main thing to remember is that the fiscal burden of immigration, such as it is, is not like Planck's constant. It's not a law of nature. It is a function of the laws that we have, which could be changed. All right, now another complaint, which I suspect has great resonance for the Institute for, Western Civiliz or Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, is that immigrants harm our culture. Uh, now, the data on English fluency alone is fairly clear. Uh, there are many first-generation immigrants who are not fluent. However, it is very unusual for second-generation immigrants to not be fluent. So generally, you'll have over 90, 95% of second-generation immigrants will be fluent. Uh, now, broader measures of culture, which, of course, uh, may very well be important, because you know, there are many, there are many prominent uh, figures in Western civilization who didn't speak English at all. Uh, shockingly. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, anyway, so broader measures of culture are hard to pin down, but uh, here's what I'll say. Western culture already dominates in the global marketplace. Western culture already dominates in the global marketplace. So nationalists around the world use cultural protectionism in order to level the playing field so that they don't lose completely. So this is why you have Canadian content regulation, so Canadian culture is not just wiped out, more, more or less. I mean, of course, Canada is by far the uh, worst offender here. But even though it's happening, most local cultures keep losing. And there's an obvious reason, which uh, I think Steve may agree with. Western culture is better. Western culture is better overall. And so people around the, rule, around the world choose Western culture as long as it's on the menu. Now, I'd also add that part of the reason that Western culture is better is, that the, is, the, is, what the, is what I call the West's openness to awesomeness. Uh, anything that is good can join Western civilization. So that's why Arabic numerals are a triumph of Western civilization. And that sounds weird. It's not really weird. <laughs> Western culture is the culture that adopts good stuff from other cultures, and that is a lot of what makes it so great. <clears throat> now, my challenge to fans of Western culture is this. Given its current massive global success, Imagine how much more dominant Western culture would be if people around the, if people around the world were free to vote, for, vote with their feet for whatever culture they actually preferred. Just imagine that. Right now, even when people are stuck in their home countries where their governments are trying to keep Western culture out as best as they can, Western culture is still very popular and indeed is generally winning. Imagine what would happen if we really leveled the playing field so that if people were not happy with the cultural offerings in their home country, they could simply pack up their bags and go someplace where they like the culture better. <laughs> Right now, if you're still worried, I'll say there is a cheaper and more humane remedy than keeping foreigners out, which is just to admit people who pass a cultural literacy test. Well, beyond the cultural literacy test, or maybe Steve could tell us what should be on it, I tell you that whatever Steve puts on the test is going to be very quickly learned by many people around the world, once it is their ticket to moving here. Now, a final common complaint is that immigrants will vote for bad policies, and as a result, they will transform our country into one of those dysfunctional countries that they try to get away from. Uh, so here, I have been looking at the data recently, and so public opinion is one of my main areas. So the data do show the foreign-born are both more economically liberal and more socially conservative. So if you've been listening to Ben, you will know this means that they are less libertarian, okay, in a word. Right? But the difference is moderate, right? and the foreign-born have very low voter turnout anyway. So while their views are less libertarian, they are, they are considerably less likely to bother to express them at all, so it probably doesn't actually make nearly as much difference as you think. Now, furthermore, there is also some good evidence that ethnic diversity reduces native support for the welfare state. So even if immigrants themselves are voting in favor of the welfare state, their presence is, uh, tends to turn natives against the welfare state. This is actually a standard story about why, about why, the, West, uh, why the welfare state in the United States is smaller, uh, smaller than Europe's. So we're a lot more diverse, and people don't like supporting, out, don't like supporting out groups. So the net effect of immigration then is actually quite unclear, and the data showed show a little effect. So for every California, there is a Texas. In California, there's a Texas. Now, if you're still worried, there is a pretty obvious cheaper and more humane remedy than keeping foreigners out, which is to admit them to live and work, but not to vote. Now, I'm not going to sugarcoat, I'm not going to sugarcoat things. Free migration is a radical change. Uh, but a radical change in the direction of human freedom is, well, you know, is as Western as Shakespeare. Uh, freedom of religion was a radical change. Uh, the abolition of slavery is a radical change. Ending Jim Crow was a radical change. Uh, before they were tried, there were plenty of people who thought these radical changes would end Western civilization. Uh, after the changes were tried, though, people realized that state religion, slavery, and mandatory discrimination were never compatible with, with Western civilization's commitment to individual freedom. Now, imagine how you personally would react if the world's governments denied you the right to live and work where you pleased because you chose the wrong parents. Uh, does that sound like the glory of Western civilization to you? Uh, I think not. Uh, Western civilization cannot realize its full potential as long as Western governments require discrimination against most of the people on Earth. Open borders will bring Western civilization to the world by bringing the world to Western civilization. 
Open borders and Western civilization are meant for each other. Thank you. Yes, I'm a ghost speaker rather than a ghost writer of this. Um, the only thing good about learning that you have 48 hours to prepare for a, a debate uh, is that you don't have long to worry. Um, <laughs> the bad thing is now what you're going to hear, that is to say my, my um, kind of butchering of what Herb would have delivered much better than, than I can. And I've, I've had to take the paper that he was going to present tomorrow in a different format and at greater length and shorten it. So I think I've, I've lost some of the factual content of the argument and I've certainly lost and cannot resupply the eloquence that Herb would have provided. But in any event, uh, who goes? Here goes. There are several value propositions in play when it comes to immigration, albeit one overarching principle I advocate, a grand bargain that includes some form of legality for long-established nonviolent illegals in exchange for an end to mass legal immigration. This is a compromise that makes sense for many on both sides of the political aisle, albeit common sense and immigration policy are not always compatible. Nonetheless, my position is stated up front so that it is not caught in the fog of background evidence. In immigration, in the immigration context, amnesty is any condition that permits illegals to remain legally. If we account for those without criminal convictions, plus those who came before age 10 and grew up here, there are about six million in this category, or half the current illegal population eligible for amnesty. To offset the amnesty provisions, immigration should be cut in half from the present 1.1 million coming into the United States annually. Cuts to legal immigration can offset the effects of amnesty since empirical evidence suggests high levels of legal immigration produce high levels of illegal immigration. Legal immigration creating the networks and connections that make illegal immigration possible. A lower level of overall immigration would tighten the labor market, ease pressure on welfare, health and education systems, and might promote assimilation, which is lagging in any case. But it is especially important in the absorption of the soon-to-be amnestied illegal population. While the illegal issue in the United States is related to immigration limits, there are other questions that must be addressed. Does the country benefit from welcoming more English-speaking skilled professionals, or should it invite low-skilled <coughs> level immigrants who fill the jobs at the bottom of the economic ladder? Clint Bullock and Jeb Bush contend there are jobs Americans will not pursue. And as a consequence, we should liberalize the opportunity for temporary laborers. Yet, it should also be noted that only 30% of the unauthorized immigrant population is proficient in English and not easily assimilable, as the evidence that follows indicates. It should also be noted that there is only one occupation in the United States of the kind noted by Bullock and Bush, agriculture, where the majority of workers are illegal immigrants. The other categories present a different pattern. For example, maids and housekeepers are 51% native born. Taxi drivers are 58% native born. Meat processors are 63% native born. Groundskeepers are 64% native born. Construction, 66% native born. Porters, 72% native born. Janitors, 73% native born. Gianmarco Ottaviano and Giovanni Piri maintain that a substantial increase in legal immigration increased the wages of native-born by 0.6%. They also found that new immigration would reduce the wages of existing immigrants by 6%. This conclusion is consistent with a 2011 comprehensive immigration analysis by Cavier Jornicki, Frederick Docque, and Lionel Rago that showed post-war immigration benefited all U.S. natives, but the benefits would have been more profound had the U.S. produced a selective skill-based immigration policy. It is precisely in this unskilled worker category that immigrant green dreams are shattered. Recent studies indicate that incarceration rates for second-generation Mexican-Americans and Caribbean-American men and adolescent childbearing and dropout rates for those of these communities are among the highest in the country. 
These are arguments that militate against easy assimilation. Moreover, by increasing the number of skilled immigrants who are likely to consume fewer public services than their unskilled counterparts, the nation's ability to assist the native-born poor and existing stock of less skilled immigrants is given a boost. Although the profile that follows is from one state, California, it does offer an indictment against further unskilled immigration. The LA Times reported that 40% of all workers in Los Angeles County, 10.2 million people, are working for cash and not paying taxes because they are predominantly illegal immigrants without a green card. 95% of the 2013 warrants for murder are illegal aliens. 75% of those on the most wanted list are illegals. More than two-thirds of all births in the country are to, in the county, are to illegal alien Mexicans. Nearly 35% of all inmates in California's detention centers are Mexican nationals. They're here illegally. The FBI reports half of all gang members in Los Angeles are illegals. Nearly 60% of the occupants of HUD properties are Spanish-speaking. Almost 4 million in the country, in a county of 10 million, speak only Spanish. Less than 2 million of the illegal population picks crops, but 29% are on welfare. On one matter, there appears to be consensus, at least if one relies on cliché-driven arguments. Just as there is a belief low-skilled immigration should be reduced, there are many who believe high-skilled labor should be increased. Uh, Alex Nokat, no, who's here today, I believe. I'm sure I'm a moment ago. Right, you. Pronounce your name. Norasta. Oh, Norasta, thank you. <laughs> the gentleman over there from Cato. <laughs> Coral skilled immigrants, the new common ground in the reform debate. However, most holders of H-1B work visas are college-educated, are college-educated, are college -educated, presumably here to fill gaps in highly specialized areas of employment. It is almost impolitic to observe that the H-1B program is manipulated by government and hardly in the hands of, free labor, of a free labor market. However, the employment picture for recent college graduates has grown bleak. The unemployment rate for Americans in their 20s is 8.8%, up from 5.7% in 2007. Unemployment stood at 18.8%, almost double of where it was five years ago. And a Congressional Budget Office report said that by 2024, Obamacare would eliminate or reduce full-time jobs for some 2.5 million Americans. The Obama uh, administration itself argued in court filings for an H-1B visa fraud, in, a, in an H-1B visa fraud case, that in January of 2009, the total number of workers employed in the information technology occupation under the H-1B program substantially exceeded the 241,000 unemployed U.S. citizen workers within the same occupation. If H-1B workers outnumber unemployed techies, and if companies that outsource tech jobs overseas are gobbling up these visas, fears about domestic unemployment may not be unfounded. Norm Motloff, who I guess is not here, uh, professor of Compu computer science at the University of California, Davis, argues that H-1B work visas are fundamentally about cheap, de facto, indentured labor. He goes on to note, the vast majority of H-1Bs, including those hired for U.S. universities, are ordinary, are ordinary people doing ordinary work, not the best and the brightest. They are simply paid less through a prevailing wage rate, a mechanism riddled with hope. The H-1B issue is a debatable proposition, but subordinate to the issue of mass, low-skilled immigration, which dominates the present debate. As long as family unification has been the linchpin of immigration policy, which has been true since 1965, the waves of unskilled workers have imperiled the nation's social service system and dramatically affected the normal digestion of employees into the workplace. 50% of unauthorized immigrant children and 60% of immi immigrant adults have no health insurance. As a consequence, they rely on emergency facilities or public hospitals for treatment. Unauthorized immigrants who are minors require more educational service than do native-born children because of a lack of English proficiency. proficiency. The CBO reviewed, measures cost, reviewed measured costs associated with services to unauthorized immigrants and concluded 
that these costs range from a few million in states with small unauthorized populations to tens of billions in California, Texas, Illinois, New York, Florida, New and New Jersey. The costs were concentrated in programs that comprise a large percentage of total state spending, health care, education, and law enforcement. In 2010, the last year of formal statistics in this matter, the average unlawful immigrant household received $24,721 in government benefits and services while paying $10,334 in taxes, an average fiscal de deficit of about $14,000 per household. Under current law, immigrant households in the aggregate produce an annual deficit of $54,500 billion. In 2010, 36% of the immigrant-headed households used at least one major welfare program, primarily food stamps and Medicaid, compared to 23% of the native population. The U.S. Census Bureau released figures the U.S. Census Bureau released figures showing that average per pupil funding from all revenue sources is $12,200. Although this number does not disaggregate the school-aged children of illegal immigrants, multiplying 12200 by 3.8 million students with illegal immigrant parents yields a total of about $46.4 billion, a sum not included in social service expenditure. While it is impossible to quantify precisely the influence of illegal immigration on crime, every law enforcement officer in recent surveys, including Dallas, Fairfax County, Virginia, Chicago, uh, and Chicago, contend that the city or county murder rate has declined from 20 to 32 percent with the reduction of alien immigration. In 2012, approximately 52 percent of the 40 million foreign-born persons were limited English proficient, practically the same percentage as in 2000. 59% of the LEP elementary school children were born in the U.S. to immigrant parents, one sign that the second generation assimilation is not as working as well as many assume. On adult, of adult immigrants, 25 to 65, 28% have not yet completed high, have not completed high school diploma, compared to 7% of the natives. Mexican immigrant teenagers have the highest dropout rate of all immigrant groups. The Social Security Administration assumes that about half of the unauthorized immigrants pay Social Security taxes. This is an assumption that has no real factual basis. In fact, most estimates uh, are that the, C that the CBO review did not include costs associated with children who were born to unauthorized immigrants in the United States because these children are not are because these children are U.S. citizens. If those children had been included in the estimate, their financial impact, particularly on education, would have been demonstrably higher. Moreover, as the CBO readily admits, the scope and analytical methods of studies vary, and the reports do not provide detailed or consistent enough data to allow for a reliable assessment of the aggregate national effect of unauthorized immigrants on state and local budgets. Yet the CBO characterizes the economic influence of illegals as likely modest. I am an emotional free marketer, Herb is speaking here. <laughs> I am too, though. I advocated free market principles when I ran for office and continue to espouse the virtues of free market today. Why then do I not embrace an open immigration policy? After all, the success of wave after wave of immigrants, despite turbulence, provides some empirical evidence for liberalization. Yet I am persuaded that open borders is a threat to the free market system we both admire. As I see it, the free, what kept, the free market is kept vibrant by a series of cultural imperatives. It is not only the law of supply and demand that keeps it functioning, but a religious, philosophical, and political position I often refer to as the burden of freedom. The market works in an ecology that includes the Protestant ethic, the rule of law, notions of personal responsibility, risk-taking, entrepreneurship, trust, and individualism. A free market remains free when mediating structures such as schools, churches, families, associations perpetuate the requisite cultural ideals. In the great wave of European immigration from 1880 to 1924, elites were generally united in advocating Teddy Roosevelt's admonition that people who come to share our shores should be Americanized. By, the, by that, Roosevelt meant immigrants should obey our laws, embrace our customs, learn our ways, and speak our language. Assimilation wasn't an option. It was a prerequisite for living here. The 1965 Immigration Act, as already noted, which relied heavily on family unification and mass immigration, led directly to a fundamental shift on the part of the immigrant population coming here and to the elites 
who welcomed him. To accommodate the new immigrants, elites created or altered an institutional apparatus that challenges the very essence of a free market in the form of affirmative action, disparate impact decisions, racial and ethnic <coughs> government grants, racial and ethnic based university <coughs> admissions. Immigration policy is now basically organized around government conferred privilege. All things being equal, and they rarely are, a Mexican-American has an advantage over a native-born American in most job applications and in admissions to colleges and universities. There is overwhelming evidence suggesting that Americanization, or what I would call patriotic assimilation, is not proceeding well. The Alejandro Portis and Ruben Rambo longitudinal study, arguably the most comprehensive of its kind, reports that children of immigrants are not assimilating, but are selectively acculturating. That is to say, many learn some English, but identify themselves increasingly with their parents' birth nation, Mexico, El Salvador, etc., instead of the USA. In their report, Portis and Rambau indicate that in one Los Angeles high school populated by Hispanic freshman students uh, were asked if they wanted to be American. The response was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, these were with freshmen, but when the same question was asked of the same students who are now seniors, only a tiny fraction answered affirmatively. The Pew Hispanic survey <coughs> taken several months after 9-11, when patriotic sentiments were running high, shows the same pattern. Only 34% of Latinos who are American citizens, in this case, consider themselves Americans first. 42% identified with the old country first, and 24% consider themselves to be pan-ethnic. Uh, as Latino, or alternately Hispanic, first. Even among the third generation, Hispanics who have held American citizenship in their family for 80 years or more, 41% considered their primary identity as either the family's country of origin or Latino Hispanic. It strikes me as obvious that you cannot seriously discuss immigration policy without comprehensive, comprehensive assimilation reform. <coughs> and in considering the latter, it must be noted that since the 1970s, American elites have altered the de facto assimilation position from America's Americanization or patriotic integration to a multiculturalism that emphasizes ethnic group consciousness at the expense of American common culture. Not only are we sending immigrants the wrong message, in my opinion, but the message we do send has a deleterious effect on the free market and its attendant cultural imperatives. And so, rem remembering that, yeah, that I am addressing her rather than you, but I, sen I sense some overlap, so. <laughs> So I was actually very surprised by the statement because I didn't see anything about Western civilization in the entire statement. It seemed like pure nationalism. I didn't see any of the appreciation of the universality of Western culture. The idea that, the, that these ideas are so great that they should be brought to everyone. The, you know, the realization that it's terrible if there's people somewhere on earth who are living in benighted unappreciation of these, of these grand traditions. So I mean, it seemed very odd to me. It seems like there is this effort to say, look, we have Western civilization right here, and we want to make sure that we keep it exactly the way it is, and if no one else on Earth really understands it, then that's okay. And saying, like, if that is your attitude, you don't understand Western civilization. Western civilization is precisely about taking everything good on Earth, bringing it under one umbrella, one ring to rule them all, <laughs> and, you know, and you know, sharing it to the world, sharing it to the world, being the light of the world. So you know, it seems, seems like a very, very odd position to take, and I don't see really much appreciation for Western civilization going there. Furthermore, I don't see a lot of confidence in Western civilization. You know, to think that you can bring people to the United States and they will be around here and continue to think that things are, or continue to identify with their home country where things are so much worse. Um, you know, like, you know, when people say they're pan-ethnic, I don't think you should read too much into that. And you know, saying, yes, I'm from this country, I appreciate things in this country, I came here for a reason. You know, especially when you, if you go and listen to what people in countries all around the world say about what, what American culture is doing to them, Western civilization in general. So in Iran, they call it West toxification. Ideas from the West keep coming in to the theocracy of Iran and ruining it for them, trying to undermine them, trying to destroy their way of life. This is the way they see it. And they're not completely delusional. Western ideas are constantly coming in. Why? Because people like these ideas. They like this way of life. They want a piece of it. If they could leave, a vast number would. Right? What immigration laws do is prevent people who are in a country, countries where their governments are doing everything that they can to keep out Western civilization from doing the obvious thing. I'm saying, look, if you won't let Western civilization come to us, we will go to it. 
Uh, now, in terms of many of the specific factual complaints, uh, main thing I can say is that it e is easy to go and find negative stories in newspapers. That's why you shouldn't read newspapers. <laughs> Rather, you should go to serious scholarly literature that does comprehensive review of all existing evidence using canonical sources. That's better. Yeah, so, yeah, reading newspapers is fine as long as you remember. What is the point of a newspaper? It is to find a scary story and tell people about it. As to whether it's actually statistically representative is, from the point of view of a journalist, not only irrelevant, it's the kind of question that ruins newspaper work. <laughs> like, you know, is this a, you know, like, so man, so like, a man bit a dog? Great story, let's put this in. Is this actually an epidemic? Is this common? Eh, let's put the story in and maybe we'll find other stories. Maybe other people will call us, they're seeing that other men are biting other dogs, so then we can continue with this. All right, so here's what we can say about physical effects. So I, mean, I, I encourage you to actually go to Google Scholar and type in net physical effects of immigration in order to get the major literature reviews from people who have looked at all the evidence. Get a very standard, very standard result. While it's unclear whether the net fiscal effect of immigration is positive or negative, it is clustered around zero. And again, for, you know, for some of the reasons I was mentioning, such as adult immigrants are, you know, have their education paid for by their home country. And of course, a lot of the things the government does have nothing to do with the population of the country. Uh, so for example, you may notice that whenever Quebec <coughs> start, talks about seceding, a very big question is what will happen to the Canadian national debt? Uh, a hardline Quebec nationalist will say, well, does the debt say Quebec on it? No. Well, then we're not paying any of it. You can see why Canada is very afraid of this, because it would mean that you're going to remove about 20% of the population of the country and leave the remaining 80% with the entire debt. All right, this works in reverse, too. If you can bring in more people in your country, you can average the cost of the national debt over a larger population. Okay. Now, furthermore, some, you know, some of the arguments were made about, the, about why, why immigrants are not paying taxes. In fact, you specifically mentioned they're not paying taxes in large part because they are illegal. Right, since my proposal is, of course, to legalize them, uh, that is not really an argument against my position. Uh, furthermore, in terms of immigrants and crime, so many lurid stories, but again, if you, if you actually go to Google Scholar, look at literature reviews of all the empirical research that have been done using the best data, a standard result is that the foreign-born have much lower incarceration rates than natives. Uh, so roughly about one-fifth of the incarceration rate of natives. Right. If that seems hard to believe, it's beginning because you spend too much time reading newspapers and not enough time perusing Google Scholar, where you can get actual statistically valid estimates rather than just going through newspapers and coming up with 100 scary stories. <coughs> Which again, of course, 100 scary stories. Uh, is that convincing? Uh, psychologically, it's very convincing. So if you read, say, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, this is the way that you, act, that you can successfully persuade people if you want them to agree with you. But if you want to find out the truth rather than just persuade, don't go and get, and get and don't don't get a hundred stories from the newspaper. Go to the best sources that are based on statistics, not stories, and you will get a very different picture. Uh, similarly, when Herb slash Steve was reviewing effective labor markets, uh, there's a very interesting trick as far as economists are concerned. Namely, so first you go over to low skilled labor markets and say those are bad because they're hurting low skilled workers. Then you go over to high skilled worker, the high skilled immigrants, and say that's bad because they're hurting high skilled workers. And you're wondering, hmm. So if we just go to every single group and say that every single kind of immigration is hurting workers in that group, then it would seem like everyone overall must be worse off, right? Uh, wrong, because that's only looking at half of the picture. You're forgetting that the workers produce stuff that are consumed by people who don't work in their industry. So if you were to go and take a look at my industry, 50% of the people that I compete with are foreign born. Is this bad for me? Yes. Is this bad for you guys? No, it's great for everyone paying tuition. Imagine how high tuition would be if you didn't have half of the professors in America foreign born. Uh, that is the benefit that you were getting. Each of us is getting a benefit from the immigrants that produce in the industries where we are not. What, and this question then is what is the overall effect? You know, this is a standard economics. The, the overall effect is that when there's more production, there's more consumption and there are higher standards of living. The same argument, by the way, well, that, that uh, Steve was delivering on Herb's behalf would also lead you to think that every kind of technological progress is a bad thing. Say, well, driverless cars are going to be terrible for taxis. Driverless planes will be terrible, or pilotless planes will be terrible for pilots. Go down the list of every possible job that could be affected by technology. And realize, wait a second, if, if it were really true that all these technological achievements are bad overall, because in each case the workers in those industries suffer, then what is Western civilization doing all around us? How did we crawl out of the muck? Right? And the answer must be, oh, I guess technology must actually be good overall. Like, well, how could it be good overall if it's bad for the workers in the industries that are experiencing the innovation? Because most people aren't in the industries. 
They're the consumers. And when you think about yourself as being a consumer of all the great products produced by everyone else, as well as a competitor of the people in your industry, it is better for you overall if, you have the, comp if the competition is out there. Well, of course, ideally, there'd be competition in every industry but mine. <laughs> all right, Brian. Um, I will stop there. First of all, with reference to, to Herb, I think he did cite a number of scholarly studies, so it really wasn't just well taken out of newspapers. But, but let me speak for myself uh, at this point. Um, I, I thought the paper which I read and, and, and the abbreviated version that, that you gave us your report was, was fascinating. Uh, and um, certainly it's more interesting to examine bold propositions than, than modest ones. Um, and you made your radical case, as you yourself call it in the paper, uh, as well as, as anyone could possibly make it. But I hear within your, your argument, which I take as being made seriously, open borders everywhere, and not just provocatively, I hear in that the kind of siren song of utopia. A single principle taken to the nth degree, backed up, to be sure, by a lot of modeling and citations of state-of-the-art studies. If you read the paper, you'll see that. And extrapolations uh, from real situations, though usually from situations remotely similar in kind, but enormously different in magnitude from, from what is being urged. But I, I think utopian nonetheless. And though pretty in the showroom, I'm told by consumer reports that utopias don't have a very good rate of historical customer satisfaction. Indeed, they're generally unsafe at any speed. <coughs> to be sure, your utopia is a utopia of freedom, of free movement specifically. And no doubt, utopias of freedom are a lot, lot better than those of coercion, which is the kind you usually get. Yet, as someone once said, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Immanuel Kant, of course, wasn't an economist. <laughs> Professor Kaplan tells us that when poor people relocate, I thought this was sort of the heart of the paper, when poor people relocate from low productivity to high productivity areas, they simultaneously enrich the world, escape poverty, and equalize the income distribution. And we're talking here about massive movements. There's an assumption made here that I think needs to be interrogated, namely that the low and high productivity or high productivity of a particular part of the world is easily separable from the cultures of the people inhabiting it. Or at least that the people moving in massive numbers from one cultural zone to another can chameleon-like shed their habits and attitudes for those common to their new surroundings. I strongly doubt that's true. Absent time, concerted effort, and a fair amount of luck. What's interesting in the world is the extent to which cultures endure <clears throat> rather than change. England gave birth to the Whig political tradition. And it is still in English settled countries that free institutions are most secure. Scandinavian countries are among the lowest in political corruption. And that's also true of states in the US where there's strong Scandinavian settlement. <coughs> the Germans developed a special reputation among Europeans for industry. And despite a great many recent historical vicissitudes, still hold on to it. Thomas Sowell, has written a great deal of good stuff on this, and he, by the way, is very much an economist, <laughs> though decidedly a non-utopian one. Here are a few of the examples of, and I could cite many others, of the distance that separates the United States and some other selected nations, likely population donor nations under Professor Kaplan's scheme, <clears throat> with respect to several politically relevant attitudes drawn from the 2010-2014 World Values Survey. On the question of how essential was it in a democracy that religious authorities ultimately interpret the laws with a scale from one, not essential, to 10, essential. Americans had a mean score of 3.11, Mexicans of 4.36, Nigerians of 5.17, and Egyptians of 6.19. With respect to the same type of scale, 
on the question, an essential characteristic of democracy is that the state makes people's incomes equal. <laughs> the means were 3.83 for the US, that's the low end, 5.55 for Mexico, 5.60 for Nigeria, and 7.32 for Egypt. On the question, government ownership of business should be increased, that being the high end of this particular scale, the mean scores were 3.71 for the US, 5.46 for Nigeria, 6.05 for Mexico, and 6.69 for Egypt. But even the acquisition of a new language, better education, more sophisticated work skills, and the reigning political views of a new locale do not guarantee the development of a shared and enduring sense of community. One that can reliably hold a society together given the ever fractious, jealous, and tribal natures, you might want to read E.O. Wilson on this, of humankind. Wasn't that one doesn't have to look far into history or contemporary events for that matter to find states whose people, though to an outsider, very much alike in language and skill attainment, nonetheless fail often catastrophically to sustain community. States in which majorities turned on apparently assimilated minorities, or in which formerly friendly neighbors lapsed into bitter and violent intergroup warfare. Promiscuously mixing people isn't likely to have the same results as mixing capital and exchanging products. They're not merely factors of production. Free trade and free movement of capital would, I think, be much better, and certainly a more prudent way of raising world incomes. And what we've already achieved in that respect with, with, since World War II has had many good effects, not only on worldwide incomes, but on dissemination of ideals of democracy and representative government. The, to me, obvious danger, then, is that too rapid or too massive movement from low to high productivity areas would degrade or collapse the more productive regions by eroding the cultural, institutional, and communal capital which keeps them producing. The high productivity regions do the lowest ones their greatest favors by example and through the dissemination of goods and services that improve life worldwide. If we want to improve the leveling of individual life chances around the world, a worldwide leveling of national communities isn't the way to do it. The ability of the United States or any of the high produced productivity countries to make the most of immigrant talents and energies depends first and foremost not on the immigrants but on those states' natives and particularly those natives who are opinion leaders in education and other parts of culture. We can and have assimilated sizable numbers of immigrants in the past but we can only do so if we feel proud of ourselves as a national community and continue to remember and transmit the ideals that have distinguished us. Even if we totally sealed our borders, we would still have to assimilate new waves of immigrants into our precious and highly anomalous institutions of freedom. That is to say, those who migrate into the sunlight from their mother's wombs. And I don't think that we're doing an especially good job of that right now. Our predominant educational mantras, after all, so much aren't, after all, so much those of American pride, but of a counter-narrative that stresses inequities over achievements, the importance of equality over individual initiative and rights, ethnic identity rather than assimilation, and the centrality of ends over means. Here I do see our political culture changing rapidly and not in a good way. If there is a mission for liberals and libertarians, I mean classical liberals, it therefore lies in recalling our nation and civilization to an appreciation of the foundations on which our triumphs rest, realistically to be sure, but also compelling them because they deserve that. Under present circumstances, continued mass immigration will only complicate that task. The lamp of liberty can welcome many more immigrants, but to do so, we must once again let it shine. At this point, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience for, for both of our speakers, and uh, then we'll come back to close, and each of you will have a chance to make your final statement. So, questions? Yes, you, sir. Yes. Um, oh, next time. When you talked about deregulation, mm -hmm. kind of the path toward uh, open borders, what are the steps? Like, what are the laws that are completely in the system of open borders that, like, like zoning certain property laws? And I mean, I would start, of course, with the different quantitative limits on who's allowed to come. Right, so you have, you know, so there are strict quantitative limits on family reunification, except for for, for young children, uh, or youngish children, uh, current American citizens. Uh, it's very hard, of course, to get a green card. Very hard to get an H-1B. 
uh, very hard to get refugee status. So you know, one obvious thing is it would just be to lift the numbers or to expand the number of categories where you can automatically get somebody in. Uh, so that's you know, one possible route. So, you know, another route would just be job related, saying that if you've lined up a job, then you get a green card. Right? That's all that's required. Right? And uh, again, so possibly this could be buying with something like where you have to post a bond so that people are confident that you're not going to go on welfare or something like this. Um, so I mean, there's, there's, so those, those, those are the main ones that I think are important. So in terms of things like zoning, uh, zoning does matter, and it matters a lot more than most people think. Uh, in Texas, you get to see how it doesn't matter. Uh, and what, the reason why you're getting such a huge population increase is because Texas has relatively lax zoning. It's very easy to build stuff here. So the people that would have been moving to other, to, uh, to other states or would have been staying in other states and living in new housing in those states, since it's not being built for them at affordable prices, they're coming to Texas. Uh, so you know, like, it is true that zoning, would t zoning tends to concentrate immigration in states that have rel relatively loose zoning regulation, uh, which I would say is another strength of Texas. It's another way where you're going to be getting a larger share of the benefit. Uh, but you know, of course, you know, like it, it would be great if, say, New York would relax its regulations so that more people would go there as well. Plenty of people would rather go there. On terms of other regulations, um, one of the last debates that I did was against a guy named Ron Unz, who was strongly pushing for a large increase in the minimum wage because he believes it will cause a lot of unemployment. Right, so, of course, normally people who say the minimum wage causes a lot of unemployment believe that that is a bad thing. He believes it's a good thing because it would then lead to lower immigration. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, I am not, I'm not making this up. So, that, yeah, that is his argument. We want a high minimum wage, it will cause a lot of unemployment, this will lead immigrants to go home. And, of course, he wants to set it up with criminal penalties and a system for ratting you out so that if you ever were to go and hire someone illegal for less than minimum wage, they then go and tell you. So like, the way to make this proposal as fiendish as possible would be to actually give a U.S. citizenship to anyone who ratted out an employer for paying him, for under minimum, paying him under minimum wage, which would then lead employers to be absolutely paranoid about ever doing it. Uh, so, you know, getting, you know, so we're getting rid of the minimum wage or having a, a, you know, an introductory wage or a, lower, or a sub minimum wage for, uh, for, you know, for, for new foreign workers is another thing that would make a difference. Uh, but again, so I would say that you know, the, the market system is sufficiently flexible that even given all the regulations that exist, the market, the market is able to handle new immigration very well and it works out fine. So I would not say we can't have immigration in until we get rid of things. I would, I would go the other way, let them in. And if there are any problems that are being caused, let's then go address them uh, and say, look, due to the fact we have a lot of immigrants, we need to go and deregulate zoning, for example. All right. Yes, sir. In your, in your opening argument, you seem to be insinuating, as I interpret it that way, that I should feel guilty for being born here. And taking that further, in your closing uh, parts of your argument, you brought up uh, slavery and suffrage mm -hmm. for women. Should I then interpret that I disagree with you that I'm a racist, a sexist, character? Mm -hmm. All right, so first question. Should you feel guilty because you are born here? Absolutely not. I was born here. I don't feel guilty. Tell me, tell me yes. why I should mm -hmm. feel guilty. Uh, well, again, it'd be just you know, people who are born here, just like people who are not born here. That is not that is something outside of your control. So, by any moral standard I've ever heard, blaming for something, blaming people for something they could not possibly have done otherwise, uh, is not fair. So, I don't know if any of so no moral system that I've heard of blame. You know, maybe you know, hear those, but uh, very few blame people for things. Blame, blame things for blame things for people. Blame, th blame people for things that are beyond their control. What I am saying, though, is that you should feel guilty for not uh, for wanting to prevent people who are not as fortunate as you from just coming and getting a job from a willing employer. Like I said, I'm not say asking anyone to give anyone anything. I'm not saying give anyone a job, give anyone a house, give anyone welfare, give anyone any stuff. I'm saying stand aside if there is a native who wants to employ them. Stand aside if there's a landlord who wants to rent to them. Uh, that is what I'm saying is fair. Now, am I insinuating that anyone who disagrees with me is racist or sexist? Uh, of course not. Uh, I am said, waiting on my yes, my yes. The reason I bring those up is though I said those are radical changes, which at the time, which before they happened, seemed like they could undermine Western civilization. After they happened, people got used to them. That is the analogy that I'm drawing. I mean, although you know, since you bring it up, I would say that a probably a great deal of opposition to immigration does ultimately come down to racism. Right. So if immigrants were white, would people be as upset? Uh, it does seem that it is unlikely they would be upset, but. Uh, can possibly otherwise, but it uh, seems that that is a, is a part of the reason. So a lot of the way that people think about immigrants has to do in part with how, whether the immigrants look like them. But uh, no, I was not making that insinuation. But the answer is I should feel some guilt. Oh uh, no, the, the answer is they should feel guilt. You, know, you should not feel guilt for being born in this country. You should feel guilty if you stop someone who's not born in this country from coming to this country.
Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, say something on this too. I, I appreciate the universalism from which uh, Professor Kaplan speaks, but I think there is a danger in kind of moralizing complex issues uh, in a manner that I that there there's some tone uh, of that in the paper and, and now particularly in your comments. Uh, I think these are complicated questions. Uh, and while it's true that someone who comes here and does hard work is making a contribution, he's also in a position in other ways to influence the lives of those who are here already. Uh, and I think those who are here already therefore have some stake uh, in considering whether they want that person and the numbers of such people uh, to come here. So I, I you know, I, you may disagree, but I think to kind of turn it into a sort of slavery type issue uh, is an unfortunate turn in the direction of the, of the debate. All right, let's take a first, a student in the back. So uh, I guess this, this, this is for you. Um, it, it seems like a large <coughs> portion of, of your argument rests upon the idea or the case that the people coming in will extract more value than they can give out. And the mechanism for that extraction uh, is, is through the government. So. And it seems like then you're, you're treating the symptom rather than the cause. Perhaps <coughs> then the issue is you said you were you know, a libertarian free market. Perhaps the, the, the better solution would be to eliminate the mechanism by which with they can control or extract the value from the other people. So if they said, like you said, you list all the statistics, <coughs> these people believe that you know government should take more control. Perhaps then we should be advocating for uh, less of an ability for those people to go and vote changes that allows business or governments to take more control of those businesses. And the second part of the statement is that uh, you said that you know as a consequence of this, these people would uh, radically change the culture. But in the the whole idea of the free market is that we get uh, you know cooperation and, and excellence. So the, the best ideas tend tend to to rise forward. So if this mechanism, uh, the government, which in, in overreach and controlling these businesses is lessened, then wouldn't it not be the case if I mean, we believe in this, this free market mechanism that that culture, the best culture, the, the culture of the West, the hard work and achievement, that sort of thing, would then triumph over, over these other beliefs? Well, the first set of questions you asked was asked of my opening statement, which of course was, was Herb London's. Uh, so I'm not in quite in as good a position to answer that part as he would be had he been here. Uh, he believes, and he argued, and he produced statistics on that point, uh, different from, from uh, the ones that um, Professor Kaplan brought forward, uh, that in fact it is for the first generation a, a net deficit. Um, but let me come to what you asked about culture, <coughs> which is what I spoke to in my response, which were kind of my words. Um, I don't think uh, cultures can be taken on and off like a suit of clothes. And I do think that the culture uh, of, put aside the West for a moment, of sort of the Anglo-American tradition, uh, is rather exceptional in many ways. I mean, I can remember uh, before we went into Iraq, um, and I have my misgivings uh, about that in retrospect, certainly, um, George Bush saying, uh, that everybody wants to be free, and hence, by going into Iraq and bringing them freedom, it would take, once we got rid of that nasty dictator, it would take, because it was the best kind of idea. I think what President Bush wasn't probably, probably, uh, properly sensitive to was that the question isn't whether everyone wants to be free, though actually there are some people who don't wish, but that's not the big, big question. The question is, are you willing to allow freedom to others? That's a very difficult thing. That's not the default human position. Uh, and my worry, it's not an absolute worry, it's not that I don't think people can be assimilated, don't think people can learn to appreciate the virtues, but I don't think it comes nearly as easily as perhaps Professor Kaplan does. And therefore, I think we have to be somewhat circumspect uh, in deciding how many uh, and whom, and also, is important, if not more important than that, we have to prepare ourselves, we have to come to believe ourselves that these are good things. I see ourselves falling away from that. Uh, not only the government itself, but the whole culture. Uh, what it speaks to, what it believes in, what it's proud in. Uh, we really have to address that if we want to be successful in making people who arrive on our shores into new Americans. All right, Dr. Cigar. Um, <laughs> now, sometimes you got to go to the extreme, and I, I, I really think you went to the extreme. I'm not Thank against you. the structural change at all. 
But then what I would say is, let's go to the other extreme. The other extreme is where we are. I'm all for marginal changes. I think there is laws, there is customs, there is preservation of identity, and you gotta kind of move forward from where we are. And I will be the first one to tell you, having experienced it myself, there is nothing wrong in my book with the current system. I was able to immigrate into the U.S. legally. I, it is hard for me to believe some people don't get the illegal part on illegal immigration. I think, yes, I will go, I'm an economist, and I've been an economist for, shoot man, I hate to admit it, almost 40 years. I think that there could be a prize, there's always a prize. We can, we're pretty good at doing things, and we could come up with a prize. If I want to immigrate to Canada today, if I show him a given amount of money, I will be Canadian within <laughs> a couple of weeks. And I know because friends of mine are Canadians. <laughs> they just showed up and said, okay, I'm coming here with this much money, I'm a Canadian. I know we can <laughs> come up with a price. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would say, follow the law. It might not be perfect, let's fix it. But there is nothing wrong with the process that has been, that has evolved since the 1880s. Uh, I think I will go to the other way. You know, I mean, you're over here, I'll go over here. I mean, of course, my opposition is that the ELB should get rid of illegal immigration, all of it, by legalizing all of it. <coughs> if we were to follow my proposal, there would be no more illegal immigration problem because it would be everyone could be here legally. So in that sense, there would be no problem. Um, in terms of like, how harshly should we judge someone who immigrates illegally, uh, I give them a big thumbs up because I think the law is unjust and it is such an unjust law that it is a good, that it, if you can get away with breaking it, you should. Uh, if that horrifies you, I believe all of you break laws every day. Uh, anyone who drives 56 miles per hour, I don't know what is actually your maximum speed here, is breaking laws. 75, I, right? 75, all right. <laughs> so, so, then you're going, so then you're going 76. Just a call. Who has ever gotten a speed ticket? Yeah. <laughs> yes, and you can't do it. Yes, you are, you're breaking it. Well, you are, you are, you are breaking the law. The law and you, you probably don't you feel guilty. You probably don't law? feel guilty Maybe. about it. You probably tried to avoid getting the ticket as much as possible. So, they, you, so you, yeah, yes, you do. <laughs> right. So, you know, um, anyway, so clearly the law is not as sacred as people say, given that you know that almost all of you are breaking the law very frequently. And the question is, which law is actually more justified? A law that says that you cannot speed, that you cannot drive at an extremely fast speed, where at a point where you might actually kill other people on the road, or a law that says that if you're born in Mexico, you have to stay there even though you can make 10 times as much money in America and save your kids from starving. Uh, I'd say speed limits actually are much less indefensible than immigration laws. Speed limits at least have some plausible reason, but people don't feel guilty about breaking those to any significant extent. So as to why what, breaking immigration laws is so awful, I, I really don't get it. Right, another question in the back there, yeah. Oh, yeah, so I had a question. Um, I'm fairly sympathetic towards your view. What about um, certain cultures or populations that may be uh, antagonistic when they immigrate? Like in Europe, you mm -hmm. see some radical Muslim populations and, um, you know, they cause problems mm -hmm. in, in Europe. Um, what would you say about that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I say they pose some problems, although you know, many groups pose some problems. Nobody talks about exiling them to the third world. About half the population commits almost all the crime in every country on earth, males, right? And yet people don't think that there's some need to do something about the male problem. Well, I mean, maybe they do, but um, <laughs> probably not. I mean, I would say, you know, I think that a lot of the reason why Europe has had a less favorable experience with immigration than the U.S is because the European welfare state is so much bigger and it really is e much easier in Europe for a new arrival to go on welfare and then not learn anything about the country that they're in and learn how to be a productive citizen. This is one of the big strengths of the US. Uh, I mean, the research on Europe fi generally finds moderately less favorable outcomes than for the US, although even for Europe it's, it's far from terrible. Yeah, I would say this is a good argument for restrictions on welfare, changing the way the benefits are done, because, you know, because it is a problem. 
and, then you, and, and would in fact lead to you know, greater economic assimilation and greater spread of the values of Western civilization. It makes a big difference if you have to go into a store and interact with other people who are different from you. Right? That makes a big difference in terms of whether you actually learn more about another culture and come to appreciate it. Uh, but you know, again, I would say you focus on what is actually the problem, and I would say the problem is the welfare state rather than immigration. And again, you know, so one of the main things that I, that I felt like Steve was not really responding to is I said, you know, I said, I said like, even if you said the problem is real, there are cheaper and more humane ways of dealing with it. If you really are worried about immigrants voting the wrong way, why not let them in and not let them vote? If you really are worried about their fiscal consequences, why not focus on the formula by which we hand out welfare rather than scapegoating immigrants for a system that really is dysfunctional for immigrant and native alike? I just don't get it. If we do that kind of thing, I will hear proclaim from many a pulpit, both religious and public, apartheid state. And uh, we will believe it, and we will be very uncomfortable with it. So I really don't think that solution is going to work. So it's better, better to actually be part than, <laughs> than to be called apart. Mm -hmm. Let's go to keep with the questions here, and we'll each get a three-minute close. If right. everybody could actually try to keep our questions short and our answers short, too. We've got Fair about enough. seven minutes to go here before we go into closing. Small pre question <coughs> before I'm going to co-tell on that gentleman's question. Assuming your policy is implemented, how would you regulate true borders and people within those borders, assuming that anyone could come to the United States or Mexico at any time? And it were like that all over the world. I guess there would kind of be no physical border anywhere with there. I mean, there's nothing in what I said that would prevent there from there being a physical border. There can still be a person who checks passports. Okay, it's just okay. that it, you're, like, so, you're, you know, so you're not a criminal, you're not on a watch list, you can, you, you, that, you can go. Um, how would you avoid it, assuming that your open border, mm -hmm. pol or open border mm -hmm. policy, open immigration policy is implemented, uh, major cultural clashes, wars, you know, big fighting events, battles, you know, because we see all these events occurring in Africa, in the Middle East, where you have these geopolitical boundaries, but that were established by people who weren't really there when these cultures formed thousands of years ago. And yet today we have no modernization of those cultures and, and wars that are basically not ever going to be stopped by anybody from the outside. Yeah, so I say you know, a big part of what you see with ethnic strife is when you have a few cultures that are, that are fairly similar in size and they're the only ones around, so they spend, each, they spend all their time fighting with each other. One of the best ways you can actually end their strife is just by bringing them into a larger civilization where they're no longer important and they no longer meet each other. It's so like Israelis and Palestinians don't fight each other in the U.S. They don't, why? It's a big country. They hardly ever encounter each other, and there's just a lot of other things to do, whereas when they are, when they are right next to each other, uh, you know, it is just much easier for that kind of fighting going on. In general, when you allow people that are hostile to go to another country where they are just a small part of it, they wind, up, they wind up forgetting what they're even fighting about because they don't even encounter the people that they're angry against. And those other people really don't pose much threat to them anymore because it isn't a question of which group controls the government. Well, your proposal is to actually create that kind of proximity by bringing a lot of groups into close contact. A lot of groups, yes. So many but, groups but, that know but, one, one group is United actually States, very important. In the United anymore. States, there certainly be more groups from certain places than for, from others. Uh, you're the one who is going to fit together in a little tiny sphere uh, all these kind of jangling ethnic particles. Uh, I, I, you know, Yugoslavia, uh, people, there were many different nationalities, not very far apart again from the outside observer's point of view, who were intermarrying, getting along together, uh, and then suddenly when the state collapsed and there wasn't a despotism sitting on top of them, fought tooth and nail with each other in kind of bloody wars. Uh, you're just, you know, I, I just think there's a kind of optimism that undergirds everything you say uh, that has a life in the kind of abstract models that you put together as an economist, but doesn't really have a life when you get down and look at how real people behave. I think it's just too far from that to be a safe set of uh, uh, injunctions to follow. Carl. Uh, Steve, I got a cultural question. You have lots um, of hands popping up too here. Uh, the, it seems to me that one of the things by limiting immigration uh, that we lose is uh, the value of getting off your dead ass and going doing something. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to move and to change cultures. And that's part, I would say, is what made uh, our country <coughs> great, is that we do have people that are willing to make the move. And they have a value that many natives don't have. And how, how could both of you speak to that 
that value that I see as important, is it important or not? Well, when I was talking to Ben yesterday, I said facetiously that my position is to allow no one to come in and to expel half the people we already have. Uh, but actually, that's not my position. I, I do believe in immigration. Uh, I think the country has prospered because of immigration. I think the country has been rich uh, by cultural variety. But it has to happen in a measured way. Uh, it has to happen with some interest in where people come from and what they're bringing. And it has to happen in an environment that encourages assimilation. And we have, we have a, an environment now that encourages disintegration. Um, and we only compound our problems, I think. So I'm not against immigration. I certainly want to see the historic pattern of immigration continue. I'm just worried about a proposal as sweeping as that uh, on a worldwide basis, as well as in the United States. Um, and uh, I think we have to be careful now. Thanks. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's a great question. So actually, off the record, many employers will confess they prefer hiring the foreign-born. Because the foreign-born are harder working, more disciplined, care more, more respectful. In other words, they have the values that are supposedly attributed to Western civilization, but actually are not so frequently found in the people who have grown up taking it for granted. Uh, so, you know, I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. So, you know, so, you know, immig immigrants are great, and a lot of it is they show us what we ought to be doing. All right, we got time for right. two more questions. Let me get a student in here, Jeff. Um, I like to think of uh, immigration as a trade of labor. It seems like we're just entirely focusing on people who want to come here. Now, if we abolish, um, completely abolish immigration laws, what would be the significance of those who might want to leave or those who might want to come for a period of time and then return to the country? Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that's, that's a very big deal in the economics of immigration, of course. What else? <laughs> people are often worried about brain drain. But the standard result in the social science is that while you do, while, while you do lose the more able workers from immigration, they also are more likely to come uh, to bring back, with, come back with investment income, with business connections, and of course with the remittances, which are, which are now actually larger than all foreign aid. So the amount of money that immigrants send home to their families is larger than all the amount of money that rich countries give to poor countries, or rich governments give to poor, to, uh, poor governments. Um, so, I mean, so, in so like in terms of like understanding what is the likely effect, uh, the history of Puerto Rico is actually very instructive. Because in 1904, a Supreme Court ruling created open borders between the U.S. and Puerto Rico. Uh, what you saw is at first there was only a trickle of immigrants, but over the course of the next hundred years or so, about half the population of Puerto Rico left. In the process, though, Puerto Rico became one of the best places in the world. And so even if you stay, you get to be in a rich country, although not as rich as if you had left. All right. Final question, sir. Yes. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, in your ideal proposal, there's no illegal immigration at all. So if you look at our current status of immigration, legal and illegal, uh, are we closer to your proposal right now or his? Let's start with 1 to 10. You're being 1, him being 10, would we move? We're about 1.3 right now. <laughs> 1.3. Yes. Again, so, wait, again, so you, you, your proposal, yes. there would be... Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, that that you know, so no, probably not immediately, but over over the media term, yes. So there is a little, you know, very good reason to think. You know, if you just want to understand how far are we from open borders, you just take a look at what are the different. If you look at the differences in wages between people in Haiti and here, and see it's a factor of twenty, uh, that is somewhere like a two thousand percent tariff. So that's enormous. You can also just look at the amount of money that people pay smugglers to get them in. So for Mexican farm workers, it's about four years worth of their income in order to get here. So people don't pay four years worth of their income for something that is not a huge change. Uh, so like, you know, I, I often like to say, immigration laws work. They have drastically reduced the amount of immigration that we have. I just think that they have, they have successfully done something that should not be done. I, I read your paper. You say something like 100 million people perhaps coming yeah, in. Well, you know, over the course of a few people. decades, but yeah, that's, that's very reasonable. Okay. Yes. We've got 3 million, 300 million. We can use another 100 million very easily. All right. <laughs> With that, let's go to uh, closing statements. So Steve, oh, gosh, the, the floor is yours. <laughs> Well, um, there was uh, once a country that was eager to get new immigrants, um, people who'd be industrious and come and, and improve the life of the country. Uh, those immigrants came, uh, they settled down. Uh, the country was Mexico, and the place they came to is now Texas and part of the United States. <laughs> so uh, immigration can often have consequences uh, rather different from what the host country Expected. Now, I'm not against, I mean, let's just repeat it time and time again, I'm not against immigration. Uh, my parents, my father, was an immigrant. In fact, for a little while, he was an illegal immigrant. 
uh, and he got tipped off that he was going to be arrested the next day and went to Canada and came back and became legal. And so here I am today, uh, a tribute to illegal immigration as well as to legal immigration. Uh, but I do think, you know, you're talking about something in which there's a very big human factor. And I don't think uh, that cultures, think of cultures as a kind of tropical rainforest. Each culture is its own particular ecological mix of species that have adapted to one another. We're always told that if we want to preserve those things, we should treat them gently. We shouldn't infuse all sorts of uh, new species in, like rabbits in Australia, places like that. We have to be careful about it. Not that we can't do it at all, but we have to take care. And I would submit, when we have as luxuriant a plant and as rare a plant uh, as we have here in the United States uh, and some other countries that are part of the West, uh, not all the countries in the West are actually all that great, but in some of them, uh, I think we want to take care. Uh, and I don't think we take proper care when we simply attach ourselves to a kind of radically universalistic principle, uh, which sounds good when it's uttered, um, but is going to have all kinds of unexpected and in all likelihood, given the fragile nature of these social ecologies, many deleterious um, consequences when put into effect. Again, I'm not against immigration, but I think we have to be careful about it. Uh, and my biggest quarrel, actually, is hardly with immigrants. My biggest quarrel is with our various elites here uh, who have lost a sense of pride in the country, the things that helped immigrants assimilate in the past. All right. Thank you, Steve. So once again, I'm in the strange position of telling Steve he doesn't really appreciate Western civilization. Mm -hmm. I don't think Western civilization is fragile. It is mighty. It is a force to be reckoned with. It is changing civilizations all over the world, despite their governments trying desperately to stop it from happening. Right now, what, 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 what is happening is that there are many people around the world who really want Western civilization. They like a lot of its products. Again, they may not like absolutely everything about it. But again, Western civilization is strong enough it doesn't need total buy-in. It doesn't require that everyone swear absolute loyalty to Western civilization. All that it requires is it offers things to people and they say, oh, I like that. I like these things. I like being able to do what I want. I like being able to watch these movies. That is what Western civilization is doing in the world. And I don't, not only do I not see any sign that Western civilization is decaying, it is winning. I mean, it is not win and it is winning even though it doesn't have elites who are there going and singing your praises. How does it win? It wins through a decentralized process of people who are pushing culture in order to make money, offering it to people who are, who are, who are offering it to people around the world who want to pay something in order to watch friends. That is Western, Western civilization at work. I had a student from Peru who spoke absolutely perfect, unaccented, unaccented English. She learned it from watching friends. Uh, she really did. <laughs> uh, now, in the question of how portable is you know, how, to, what, you know, how portable is culture, or like how really how attached is it to people? Uh, here again, we, we don't have to just speculate about this. Serious research has been done. So if what Steve is telling you is correct, that people's culture is infused into their very being, then you think that when a Haitian came to the United States, that he would continue to earn something like the amount that he earned back in home in Haiti. This is not what we see. Rather, what we see is that people who come from poor countries earn quite a bit less than people who were born, born in the United States, but they earn many, many times more than what they're earning back at home. So we can say is that from the, from the empirics, we can actually break down. So what fraction of the low earnings of Haitians is due to them being Haitian versus living in Haiti. And the breakdown is something along the lines of 90% living in Haiti, 10% and 10% being Haitian. Like I said, the Haitian, you know, Haitians do seem to be less productive for a bunch of reasons. Again, so lower levels of literacy, worse health. Right? So there are a bunch of differences between people in other countries and people here. But you can take a look at labor markets to sort out how important are those differences, what is the relative difference. And the answer is that actually it is primarily just being in a country that is messed up rather than being a messed up person that actually counts. Okay. Also, um, so again, just going back to the, to the fragility point, I am puzzled by why you would think that something that has been so successful and can you succeed all around is, uh, is in fact so fragile. Looks to me like Western civilization is doing great and it probably would have won a long time ago if only people who were stuck in, country, in you know, stuck in countries where their governments are trying to keep them from accessing it could have packed their bags and left. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, I thank you all for joining us, and, and Brian for coming here, and especially Steve for so yes, graciously filling in on that. 
So hopefully a provocative lecture and I hope to bring you more debates that are equally provocative in the future. Thanks for coming everybody.